Hi guys, this is the first class of the macroeconomics and I'm going to cover the chapter one and the basic macroeconomics concepts. So economics is not just about the money, it's about the scarcity and choice because we are living in the world where the resources are limited. So you need to make a choice to maximize something. So as a consumer, you want to maximize happiness and which we call it utility. And producers, they maximize a profit. So that's the economics. And then I'm going to talk about the difference, difference between the microeconomics and the macroeconomics. And the second concept is the following. So individual choice is decision by the individuals about what to do. That being said, that it involves a decision about what not to do. So for example, when you have a launch, let's say that you have a two options. So you either have the Shake Shack Burger or the Five Guys. So that means that when you go for the Shake Shack Burgers, that means that you give up the Five Guys, right? And then the, an economy is a system for coordinating a society's productive and consumptive activities. So here we have the producers and the consumers. And between these, you can see that the employer is selling and the services and the products, right? And we have a, in general, uh, we can say that there are two types of the economy. One is a market economy and the command economy. So the market economy is almost everywhere, US, Canada, so on and so forth. But then the, their command economy, for example, North Korea, China, and Soviet Union. And then the macroeconomics examines the overall behavior of this economy. So between the producers and consumers, and we also have the market structures and the government and central bank. So we want to study about these interactions. And in economics, when you talk about the incentive, it's not just about the rewards, it could be the house punishments too. So that motivates the particular choices, that's the incentives. And after that, uh, we are gonna study about the margin analysis, which is the study of the costs and benefits of doing a little bit more of an activity versus a little bit less. So uh, for example, you will study about the marginal of labor. So marginal product of labor. That means when you hire one additional worker, how much he or she contribute the output. That's a margin of labor. And then when you talk about the research in economics, that could be anything that can be used to produce something else. That's something else we in general, we live for the output, the final products. And the research, another name is factors of the production. So we have a four resources. The first one is a land, timber, water, minerals. And then the second one is a labor, which is the effort of the workers. The other one is capital, machinery, buildings, and tools. And then the last one is entrepreneurship, risk taking, innovation, and the organization of the resources for productions. But in general, this land and entrepreneurship is hard to measure. So we use a labor and capital for the, to make it simple. So labor, we denote L and the capital, we denote K because a C is already used for the consumption. So that's why we denote the capital as a K. So for example, you're gonna study about the production function, which is the following. So Y is the final output. That is the function of the capital and labor. So in order to make the output, you need to have the capital and you need to have the labor. And this app captures the production functions. So for example, you have the Cocteau's production function, which looks like following, A times K to the power of alpha, L to the power of one minus alpha. At this point, you don't need to know the details, but this is uh, the famous production function, which can capture the real world production function. So I'm gonna talk about the later, but what I'm talking about is that uh, we can use a labor and capital uh, to make something. But we don't use the land and entrepreneurship because it is too uh, difficult to measure and it's too uh, complicated. So we mainly use these two resources, the land, uh, sorry, the labor and capital. Now, this opportunity cost, the concept is a very, very important. So uh, take a look at the two definitions. The first one is following. The real cost of the something is what you must give up to get it. And the second definition is following. The value of the choice of a best alternative cost while making a decision. So it is very important in individual choice and decision making to understand this opportunity cost. 
So I highlight this a best alternative cause and you will get to know one. So take a look at an exa example. The first one is following. If you spend the $20 on the pizza, that means that you forego the opportunity to spend the $20 on a hamburger. So that means that pizza's opportunity cost is a hamburger. Now the second is example is the following. So let's say you prefer watching YouTube the most. The second one is a list of music, music. And then the least favorite one is a reading a book. So if I ask you, what's the opportunity cost of watching YouTube? So that means if you decide to watch YouTube, that means that you forego listening music and reading a book. And between this, what's the best alternative, alternative one? Listening music. So that means opportunity cost of the watching YouTube is a listening music. Now, what's the opportunity cost of the reading a book? Well, if you read the book, you cannot watch YouTube, you cannot listen to music, right? So that means that opportunity cost of the reading a book is watching YouTube. Because between these two, the better one is watching YouTube. That's the best alternative, right? And then the third one, on Saturday, you have two options. One is that you do homework, and the other one is going to Central Park with your family. Well, if you decide doing homework, that means that you give up going to Central Park with the family. It's not just about the money and time. Uh, it, could, it cannot be measured, right? On the other hand, if you decide to go to the Central Park with your family, then you give up doing homework. So that's the opportunity cost. Now, the fourth one is a very famous example. So when you graduate the high school, you have uh, mainly two options. One is uh, going to college, and the other one is uh, seeking immediate employment. Let's say you go to college, and you need to pay the tuition $60,000. Okay? But your friend, he got a job, and he's making $40,000. So that being said, What's the opportunity cost of the going to college? Well, you first need to pay the $60,000 and that we call it explicit cost. You need to pay upfront. So that's the explicit cost. And if you get a job, you would have on $40,000. So that's the implicit cost. So together, opportunity cost of going to college is together is $60,000 plus $40,000, that's $100,000. All right, so now let's talk about the difference between the microeconomics and the macroeconomics. In microeconomics, you study about the economic agents, which is following. So you first study about the consumer, consumer theory, and then you study about the producer, producer theory, and then you study about the market structure, so consumer theory is basically everyone has a budget and within budget, they want to maximize their happiness. Happiness. So that happiness, we call it the utility. So that means that basically you solve the utility maximization problem. On the other hand, the producer, they want to maximize the profit. So that means that they solve the question, the profit maximization. Or we call it, this is a duality. That is, profit maximization is same as a cost minimization. So that's a producer theory. And then you study about the microstructure, so the market structure, which is following perfect competition. So there are so many buyers and sellers and none of them can affect the price then we call it the perfect competition and they are having the same products, the commodity. And the extreme departure um, from the perfect competition is a monopoly. And then you study about the oligopoly. So oligopoly is there are few companies in the market. And especially when there are two companies or the two firms in the market, we call it the duopoly. And then you study about the monopolistic competition. So that's the micro. Then what about the macro? Well, the macro is the interactions between these agents, consumers and producer. And we, on top of that, we add the uh, governments and the central bank. And we want to study the interactions between these. 
And the most important part is that we want to know the fluctuation in macro terms. So that means that there is up and down. And we want to talk about this up and down and how to minimize this up and down. So there are three macro three macro chemicals. So this is a very, very important. The first one is the following. The first one is a cheap economic growth. So then what's the economic growth? You want to produce more. So every single country, every year, they want to produce more, okay? So then how can you achieve the economic growth? So it's very simple. So why equals F of K and L? Like I told you, you have the more workers, then you can produce more. You have the more produce, more capital, more machines, more buildings, more tools, then you can produce more. And also you can have the better technology. So that's a production function. So pretty simply, you have a more workers, you have the more capitals and you have a better technology then you can produce more. And then also you can talk about the quality of the labor and quality of capital. So quality of labor, so that means that it's better to have the bachelor degree workers than the high school diploma workers, right? So that's the quality of the workers. So that being said, the PhD and the masters, they're in general better than the uh, bachelor degree, right? So that's the quality of workers. And capital, so we can talk about the quality of capital. So for example, MacBook Pro is better than the MacBook Air, right? In terms of the, uh, the speed, right? When you do something, when you're using the MacBook Pro, it's faster than the MacBook Air. So that's the first one, achieve the economic growth. Then what's the second one? Well, we want to have the stable price level. So when the price goes up, then we call it the inflation. Price goes down, we call it deflation. Well, you saw that, you probably saw that for the last couple of months, we have the huge inflation problems Right, so that's why the central bank they implemented the contraction market policy. So basically, they raise the interest rate and they reduce the money supply. And we want to understand why they did that and how it affects the market and how it uh, the mechanism they suppress the price level by having this contraction market policy. So that's the second one. And then the last one is the following. This is uh, connected with the first one, which is low unemployment. So we want to reduce the unemployment rate. So then how can we measure this economic growth, price level and unemployment? So that's the first question. And how can we understand these things and what's the mechanism and what's the formula? And this will, will cover chapter one and chapter two. All right, so let's go to the slides. So the chapter one, in this chapter, we talk about the issues of the macroeconomic study and then the tools of macroeconomists use and so important concepts in macroeconomic analysis. So the first page. So macroeconomics is a study of the economy as a whole, addresses many top, topical, typical issues, such as what causes a recession. So for example, we can talk about the 2008 financial crisis, or you can talk about the COVID-19 and COVID-19, why the government gave you the stimulus check and was it helpful to mitigate the recession? And then the following question is, uh, how can problems in the housing market spread to the rest of the economy? That's the 2008 financial crisis, which we call it the subprime mortgage. And then the last one is, uh, what is a government budget deficit? So basically the budget deficit means that when government spends more money than their income and their Ex expenditure is a government spending and their income is a tax. When they collect the less taxes than their expenditure, then they face the budget deficit. On the other hand, they collect the more taxes than their spending, then we call it the budget surplus. When these two are the equal, so what I'm saying is following, government spending is G and government income is a tax. When the G is a greater than T, that's a budget deficit. When G is a less than T, that's a budget surplus. When G equals T, that's a balanced budget. 
But as you know, US every single year, we face a budget deficit. That's why the, our budget gap is accumulative and is uh, increasing drastically. Okay? And we're gonna talk about the details later. And then the question is, uh, what's the budget deficit? Yeah, as I told you, when the G is greater than T, when their spending is their income, spending is greater than their income, then we say that government face a budget deficit. And we want to know how does it affect the workers, consumers, and business and taxpayers? Okay? What's the consequences of this budget deficit or the budget deficit? We want to know. And we can talk about the details by having the, a couple of the models. Okay? And then another issue that we can talk about through this uh, macroeconomics is the following. Why does cost of the living keep rising? So that's about the inflation. And then the second question is, uh, why, is so, uh, why are so many countries poor? So even though the two countries, they have the same amount of capital and the same number of workers, they can have a different amount of the productions, right? For example, they have a uh, political issues or they, they have the instable, uh, again, the political issues. So for example, Ukraine versus Russia, or you can also talk about the technology. So what I'm telling you is that even though these two countries has a, have the same number of the workers and capital, when they have a different technology, then the better technology produces more. So that means that we can call it that country is advanced country and the other one is an emerging market or the uh, developing country. And then the last one is, uh, what's the trade deficit? This is the same as a budget deficit. You import more than export, then that's the trade deficit. When import is less than export, that's a trade deficit. So that we will cover in chapter six and chapter 14. Okay. And this is data, US real GDP per capita. So I'm going to talk about the details about this one later, but here first you can see that the Leo, and then the second one, this is a GDP gross domestic product. We're gonna study the details uh, in chapter two. And then the last one is a per capita. That means that we divided by the population. So the first one, uh, this is a Leo, that means it's not nominal. So there is a base year and the base year is a 2012. So you control the price. So in order to measure this Leo GDP per capita, and then the second one GDP is a gross domestic product. So basically how much this country can produce, uh, that's a GDP. And then the last one per capita, like I told you, you divide by uh, the population. So for example, here, uh, 2019, I think that is about uh, 50, something thousand dollars, right? So then on average per person, they are producing about the $50,000 worth products on average per year, okay? And you can see that there is up and down. Of course, that you can see the patterns are over sloping, but from here, you can see the deviation up and down. And the ideal one is that we want to mini minimize this up and down. So to make a stable uh, output growth, okay? And then this is an inflation rate. Uh, again, I'm going to talk about the details later. Inflation rate, we denote the pi t, and that is pt minus pt minus one over pt minus one times 100. So that's how you measure the inflation rate. And here the pt, that's the price measure, and you can use consumer price index, CPI, GDP deflator, sorry, GDP deflator. And then the last, we can use a PCE deflator. Okay? These measures we can talk about in chapter two. And you see that here, uh, when we face a recession in general, uh, we have the deflation. But it's not a de deflation, but when the price level goes down, but it's not that much, and what were the stable? Uh, it becomes a stable. Then we call it the disinflation. But when the price goes down, we call it the deflation. When price goes up, inflation. In general, uh, when the recession happens, 
this crisis happens, so then the price is, uh, you know, stabilized. But before that, you can see that already after stabilized, the price goes up. That means that uh, there is a boom, economic boom. Okay. Unemployment rate, uh, you see that when the, something happens, bad things happen, unemployment rate goes up. The financial crisis, unemployment goes up. So when you take a look at the data about the COVID-19, the unemployment rate increase up to 90% something, okay? Now, basic economic models. So we're gonna talk about the demand and supply. That's the beginning of the model, okay? So let's talk about the supply and demand for new cars. And here we have the variables. So QD, QS, so QD is a quantity of the cars that buyers demand, S is a supply, okay? And P is the price of new cars, and the Y is the aggregate income, and the PS is the price of skill. That's the input. Okay? And then the demand equation is following. So demand equation is a function of the price and the income, right? And then it shows the quantity of the cars consumers demand is related to the price of cars and aggregate income. That being said, the price and the quantity demanded it gives you the negative relationship. So what I'm saying is negative relationship between price and quantity demanded. So price goes up, quantity demanded is low. Price is low, then the quantity demand is high. And we call it low of demand. So it is very natural. Something becomes expensive, then people buy less. Something becomes cheaper, then people buy more. That's the law of demand. So let's talk about the graph, uh, so details. So here, we, you can also have the specific functional form. So here, the demand is 16 minus 10p plus 2y. So that tells you, first, when the price goes up, then demand goes down, inverse relationship, or the negative relationship. And your income is increased, then the demand is increased. Okay, and we can draw the graph like this. So demand equation is a downward sloping because like I told you, when you can pick up the two points here, A and B. When the price of the car is high, then the quantity demand is low. When the price of the car is a low, cheap, then the quantity demand is high. So you can see that inverse relationship between the price and quantity. That's the movement along the curve that captures the inverse relationship between the price and quantity. That's why we have a downward sloping demand curve because of the low of demand, okay? Now, we want to know that when this curve shifts to the left or shifts to the right. Well, there are the exogenous factors that shift this demand curve. The first one is following, number of the consumers. When there are number of consumers is increased, then you can expect that this demand curve shift to the right. Okay, the more people they the more uh, they want to buy more of the cars, right? So the first factor that shift this demand curve is the number of consumers. Okay, and then the second one is changes in taste. So let's say this is uh, the the general cars. But people want to have the electric cars, right? So if the people's taste are changed from the, the gasoline cars to the electric cars, then this demand for, demand for the gasoline car should be decreased. That means that this demand curve should be moved up, okay? So that's a taste. And then the third one is expectation. So let's say somehow, there will be tax credit for electric cars, then people want to buy more electric cars instead of the gasoline cars. Then this demand curve for gasoline cars shift to the left. So that's the expectation, okay? And then the fourth one is income. So most of the goods are normal goods. So the normal good means that when your income is increased, then the demand is increased. On the other hand, there's inferior good. So that means that when your income is increased, demand is decreased. 
So that was the example of the inferred good. For example, we have pub public transportation. and junk food or the fast food. So think about it. You become a billionaire. Are you going to take, take the subway or the bus in New York City? I don't think so. So you probably have at least the Uber or you can have the private driver, okay? Or you can, your, you can have the, your own car. So what I'm saying is that your, is in, your income is increased and you are not going to take the public transit Transportation as much as before, right? You're gonna, de your demand will be decreased. And the junk food and the fast food is the same. So you become a billionaire and probably the, the you know, number of the time that you go to the McDonald's will be drastically decreased, right? Because the junk food or the fast food is an inferior. Your income goes up, demand goes down, we call it the inferior. And then the last one is, oh, so here in this case, when your income is increased, this uh, car is a uh, normal good. That means that when people's income in increase, then this demand curve shift to the right. So, for example, you used to have the one car, but your income is increased. Now you want to have two cars or the three cars, right? So that's why this demand curve shift to the right when your income is increased. And then the last one is following uh, the the related goods, the prices and products, related goods and services, the prices of the related goods and services that affects this demand curve. So we have a two relationship. Let me adjust these things. One is a substitute and the other one is a complement. So what's a substitute? You uh, go for either coffee or tea, that's a substitute, coffee versus tea. You take the bus or subway, so this bus and subway, these are the substitutes, right? Complements, on the other hand, you consume together. Cars and gasoline, that's a perfect example. So let's say the gasoline price is increased. Then what happened to the demand curve for cars? It shifted to the left. Why is that? It's expensive to maintain car, so because of the high price of the gasoline, then people's demand for cars shift to the left, decreased. What about the bus and subway? So I, I mean here, public transportation, you can take your car or you can take the public transportation. Let's say that the public transportation price is drastically increased, then why not? You, it's better to have a car, right? So in that case, the demand curve should go like right? All right, so move on. And then we can talk about the supply. Now you see that the supply curve is upward sloping. Why it is this a upward sloping? So that means that we have the positive relationship between the price and quantity supply. Okay. Basically, the idea is when the price goes up, producers they want to sell more. Why? Your profit will be increased. So it's the same as in general, in general. Let's say that you can make $15 per hour and you used to work for five hours per day. But let's say that your boss lays a uh, your salary from the $15 to $30 something, so it becomes double, then you probably want to work more because you can make a more profit, right? You have more, more income. So that's why the price and the quantity supply has the, they have the positive relationship, okay? Same as before, the demand curve. Now you become a producer, then you can talk about when the supply curve shift to the left, shift to the right, that's an exogenous change, right? So the first one is a following. Number of the producers. So if there are more producers, then obviously the supply curve shift to the right. Okay. If there are less producers, then the supply curve shift to the left. Okay. And then the second one that shift the supply curve is a following changes in technology. So think about it. You have a better technology, then you can produce more. So let's say that you are making YouTube videos and now you have the Mac Pro, so you can make the more YouTube videos with the same amount of time compared with the um, MacBook Air, right? So you have the better technology, that means that you can produce more. So in that case, this supply curve should to the right. Now, the third one is changes in input prices. So input prices are increased, then what happens? Supply will be 
decrease. So for example, steel, price of the steel is an increase, then this supply curve should turn around. Okay. And then the fourth one is changes in expectation. So you know some news about this car industry. Let's say that there is an increase in the anticipated future price of these cars will be, uh, sorry, an there is an increase, there will be an increase in the anticipated future price of a car. Then at this point, then you're gonna supply less. Why is that? Because it's better to sell it later. So what I'm saying is, if you expect there will be an increase in the anticipated future price of a car, then it's better to sell it later. So today you sell less. So that means that supply curve shift to the left. And on that day, when there is an increase, then you sell more, okay? And then the last one is the same as before the demand curve. There is a related goods and services. And same as before, substitutes in production. And complement in production. So what's the substitutes in production? So let's talk about the Apple. So they have a one factory line. So they either produce iMac or MacBook, okay? So that's a substitute in production. You either produce an iMac or a MacBook. So that means that this iMac and the MacBook, they are substitutes in production. So let's say, let me write down here. So let's say that this supply curve is about the MacBook and price of the iMac is increased. So the price of the iMac is increased. Okay, then what happened? You need to send more iMac because the price is increased. That means that you produce less than MacBook Pro, MacBook, right? So then supply of the MacBook should be shifted to the left. Now, what, what about the complements in production? So the best example is a crude oil. So from the crude oil, you can make gasoline. And as a byproduct, you have the heating oil. So price of the gasoline, let's say the increase, then what happened to the heating oil? The supply of the heating oil shifts to the right, it will be increased. Because of the gasoline prices increase, producers, they want to sell more gasoline. As a result, we have a more heating oil. So that means the supply of the heating oil shipped to the right, okay? Now, that's the things that we talk about the demand and supply. So first, you have the downward sloping demand curve because the low demand price is high, quantity demand is low, price is low, then the quantity demand is high. On the other hand, the supply, you can see that both positive relationship between the price and the quantity supply because the price is high. As a producer, you want to sell more to make to maximize your profit. Okay, and then we also study about the factors that shift this demand curve and the supply curve. Okay, now we put it together. Then you can see that there is an intersection here, and we call it this one is an equilibrium. And then from there you can find the equilibrium price and equilibrium quantity. Q star, P star and Q star, okay? All right, so here, when you, have, when you put this demand curve supply curve together, then you can have the intersection, that's a market equilibrium. And from there, you can find the equilibrium price and equilibrium quantity, okay? So, like I told you, when there's something happens, the so exogenous factors that are changed, then this demand curve or the supply curve can be shifted to the right or shifted to the left. So this example is following. There's an increase in income, uh, then increases the quantity of the cars consumers demand at each price. That's why the demand curve shifts to the right. As a result, what happened to the price? The price of the cars, it will be increased and the quantity of the cars is increased. So I can see there's a typo, sorry. So this is not the price of pizza. Uh, this is has to be price of car and this is has to be quantity of cars. Okay. Now here, uh, same typo, sorry about that. Uh, there's an increase in 
price of the input, so that's the steel price is increased. And uh, like I told you, input price is increased and the supply is to the left. As a result, what happened? Price goes up, quantity uh, goes down. Okay? So the factors that shift this demand curve and the supply curve, that's the exogenous variables or the exogenous factors. And then the endogenous variable is just price and the quantity. So you see that endogenous variable, the price and quantity demand is so for the demand curve and price and the quantity supply. So that's a supply curve. Okay. From there, you can see that in downward sloping demand curve and this one, the price and the quantity supply, you have the upward sloping supply curve. And then the exogenous variable, in this example, we have the income and the price of the steel. So that changes this demand curve and the supply curve. Okay. All right, so oh, we can move on. So market clearing is nothing but uh, the, when demand equals supply, that's a market clearing. So when the demand, so for example, let me give you the graph here. So like I told you, market clearing, when demand equals a supply here, so what if the price is uh, higher than the equilibrium price? So this is a P star. But what if the price is set as a P2? Then in the case, demand is here, but then supply is here. Okay? So let me denote the D2 and the S2. So then the supply is greater than the demand. So in the case, we call it the surplus. What if the price is lower than the equilibrium? So let's say the P3 here. So in the case, supply is here and demand is here. You, you see that the demand is greater than supply and we call it the shortage, okay? And then the famous example that makes a surplus uh, is a minimum wage. So when the minimum wage is greater than equilibrium wage, so there are more people to get a job than the positions, right? So in the case, you have the unemployment. So that's a surplus in this case, okay? All right. And then we're gonna talk about the flexible prices and the sticky prices. So in macroeconomics, when you distinguish the time horizon, short run and long run, in the short run, prices are sticky. That means the price is not changed. And in the long run, however, the prices are flexible, then it will be adjusted, okay? So you can think that in the short run, price does not move or the price stays there. On the other hand, in the long run, prices will be flexible, so it will be adjusted. Okay? And then here is an outline of this book. So we're gonna study about the, the basic things in this chapter, chapter one and two. And then we talk about the other things such as the money and the inflations. And the after that, uh, that's a chapter two to five. So we're gonna study about the GDP, CPI, and the unemployment in chapter two, we talk about the data. And after that, we study about the output and the uh, production function. That will be chapter three, okay? All right, so let me stop here.